Hello, welcome back. Tonight is page 169, Dead or Alive, June 17th, 1936. I want to situate my camera because I'm afraid some of my friends might not be able to see me. Well, let me get my shirt straightened out here. I just want to make sure that we're all, you know, clear and together. And you know, I love you, my Red Sox fans. Dead or alive, June 17th, 1936. Go Dodgers. <laughs> I folded Hattie May's article and found myself in the same somber mood the town of Manifest had been in after that cross had been set on fire in front of the German fraternal hall. It usually didn't take me long to find a news auxiliary that related to Miss Sadie's stories. The events she told me about so far had taken place over the course of several months and Hattie May's articles were all dated and ready for reading. Plus, I had time on my hands. Letty and Ruth Ann were away for a couple of days at their great aunt Bert's second funeral. Her first, they said, had been on Aunt Bert's 74th birthday. She'd wanted to hear all the nice things folks would say about her, so they went ahead and held the services early. That's one way to do it. By this time, <clears throat> but this time was for real, and Letty said everyone was trying to come up with new nice things to say. Unfortunately, his great aunt Bert could be a bit cantankerous. They were having to be creative. According to Letty, most of the family agreed that in the future family members would be allowed only one funeral or they'd have to pick if it would be and they would have to pick whether it would be when they were dead or alive. Thus the title of our chapter, maybe. With Letty and Ruth Ann gone and no prospects on who the Rattler might be, I was left with nothing to do but hunt down more roots, weeds, herbs, and bugs for Miss Sadie. One morning, she had me traipsing out at the crack of dawn for prickly poppy toad flax, spider wart, and skeleton weed. If that doesn't sound like the makings of a witch's brew, then I'm the queen of England. I made a pass into town, hoping to stop by the newspaper office for a glance through some of Hattie May's old newspapers. She was just pouring herself a cup of coffee. Well, good morning, Abilene, she greeted me with a smile. I'm fresh out of lemonade this morning. I've got a little milk if you'd like some. The smell of her fresh pot of coffee took me back to many a chilled morning with Gideon. Could I have coffee, please? Well, sure, if you think you'd like it. There's a little cream. Help yourself, sweet pea. Now, it may not be unusual, since the rise of Starbucks, for young people to enjoy coffee beverages. But when I was a kid, and certainly back in the 30s, it was probably a little less common than it is today. So thus her surprise when she asked for coffee. I liked it when she called me Sweet Pea. Mr. Leslier, did you ever drink coffee when you were little? I thought it was gross. He thought it was gross. So did I whenever I was little. Okay, I just wondered because, you know, he wasn't alive in the 30s, but closer. Thanks. I liked it when she called me Sweet Pea. Thank you, I said, pouring in more cream than coffee. I thumbed through the stack of papers, enjoying the smell of ink and newsprint. Those old newspapers were full of stories about all kinds of people in good times and bad. Mainly, I looked for Hattie May's news auxiliary. It was in her who's, what's, why's, when's, and where's that I found the most colorful, interesting news. Hattie May, I said, working out my nerve, how come nobody seems to know much about my daddy? Why, what do you mean, she said, not looking at me. I can tell you your daddy was sure one to fish. I know, he fished, swam, and caused havoc. That's what Shady said. I remembered the look of revelation Shady'd had when I told him about Miss Sadie's story. 
he'd been pretty tight-lipped about Gideon ever since. It seemed Hattie Mae had a case of lockjaw herself. I wondered if Miss Sadie had cast a spell over both of them. Maybe I could undo her hex. Okay, so do you think there's really a hex over them, or do you think she's maybe exaggerating the fact that every time she asks about her father, she never really gets what she considers a straight answer. And when she says she has a case of lockjaw herself, well, lockjaw is when you have a really hard time opening your mouth, your mouth is sore, hurts to open, hurts to bite down. Um, sometimes you can have um, uh, something like that whenever you like grit or grind your teeth at night. Um, now, she's being exaggerating here. She doesn't actually have lockjaw, but she's saying, well, she seems to have a case of lockjaw herself, meaning she seems unable to give her any more answers than even Gideon was able to give. There has to be something more. I mean, he lived here. If a person lived and breathed in a place, shouldn't he have left some kind of mark? Shouldn't there be some kind of who's, what's, why's, and where's that he left behind? Hattie Mae put down her mug. You miss your daddy, don't you? I nodded, thinking that I'd started missing him before we'd ever said goodbye. Well, she said thoughtfully, maybe what you're looking for is not so much the mark your daddy made on this town, but the mark the town made on your daddy. Hattie Mae stared into her coffee as if she was looking for the right words to say. This town left its imprint on your daddy probably more than he even knows. And sometimes it's the marks that go the deepest that hurt the most. Like a scar, I said, touching my leg. It was that scar on my leg that marked me and had marked a change in Gideon. Hattie Mae patted my arm. That's right, sweet pea. I cut my hands around the coffee mug, trying to feel any warmth that might be left. It had gone cold. Shady said, to tell you he's holding church services this Sunday night and he'd be pleased to have you. Hattie Mae looked at me with a kind of smile. Sad smile, thanks for the coffee, I said. Billy Clayton rode up on his bike just as I was leaving. He had a half a bag of newspapers left to deliver. Hey, Abilene, he said. His freckles stood out even against his tanned face. Hey, Billy, I said, still distracted by my talk with Hattie Mae. How's your mama and the new baby brother of yours? I remembered how relieved Billy had looked when Sister Redempta had told him his mother and the new baby were all right. They're fine. Little Buster, that's what I call him. He's been pretty colicky. But Sister Redempta brought, you a, a, brought over some of Miss Sadie's ginger tea. You just soak the tip in a rag and let him suck on it. Calms him right down. Sister Redempta brought it over, I asked. Yep, just yesterday. So Sister Redempta had been at Miss Sadie's place. Remember, she thought she saw her. She must have just come out when I'd run into her. I had a hard time imagining the two in the same town, let alone in the same room at the divining parlor. Miss Sadie, in all her jangly regalia, and Sister Redempta with her stark habit. They seemed like a mismatched set of bookends in their flowing gowns, beads, and veils. What could have prompted Sister Redempta to venture down the path to Miss Sadie's? Perdition? it said on her gate. According to Miss Sadie's story, Jinx himself had welded that on the gate. Had it been at her request, or had he deemed it an appropriate name for the divining, diviner's den of iniquity? The question swirled and remained unanswered when Billy said, well, I better get these newspapers delivered or Hattie may will be after me. All right, see you, see you later, Billy, I called, still lost in thought. On my way out of town, I chanced to pass by the faded gingerbread house I'd seen when I'd first come to manifest. The one with the proper lady sitting in her rocker. There she was again, like she'd been there the whole time without moving. 
and like her life was standing still. If she was alive, Letty and Ruth Ann had told me that her name was Mrs. Evans. She was the lady who, you could, who could turn you into stone if she looked you in the eye. They said she never talked to anyone, just sat on her porch and stared. I stopped at her paint chipped face. I, I stopped at her paint chipped fence. Paint chipped face would be weird. Fence looking at her from the side of the porch so she wouldn't see me. It was like she wasn't really seeing anything, just staring. Then, still without looking at me, she raised her hand ever so slightly and her fingers waved at me like she was tinkling one of Mercedes wind chimes, making music that only she could hear. Miss Sadie had given me directions. The prickly poppy had white petals with orange and red in the middle. She said to look for them along the railroad tracks. Skeleton weed was purple with no leaves. I was to look near the grazing pasture at the old Cybulski's place and so on. I'd already found the skeleton weed, spider wart and toad flax right where she'd said but the prickly poppy was nowhere to be found. With my flower sack stacked with, with, I cannot read tonight. With my flower sack stuffed with plants and weeds, I wandered along the railroad tracks, letting my footsteps fall evenly on each tie. There was comfort in those tracks in my being on them. I closed my eyes and let them guide me, one foot after the other. I imagined Gideon at the other end of the line, working his way toward me, one foot after the other. It was like one of those story problems in school. If Gideon leans, leaves Des Moines, Iowa at 6.45 a.m. traveling one railroad tie at a time, <clears throat> and I leave Manifest doing the same, how long will it take us to meet? I was figuring the problem in my head, but started imagining him on a train getting here faster. It must have been the growing heat, but I could feel the tracks vibrate beneath my feet. I kept my eyes closed, trying to recall the sound and movement of train on track that could make you feel lonely sometimes and peaceful at others. Without my willing it, a rhyme formed in my head. Walking, walking, gotta keep walking, gotta keep walking all the way back. Looking, looking, gotta keep looking, miles to go on this railroad track. Do you like that, Betty? She's at my feet, she seems to like it. I heard a mournful whistle off in the distance, heard the rattle of the boxcars as they worked across the joints. A train will be coming, a train will be coming, 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 train will be coming to take me back. That train seemed so close I could smell the soot and steam. If I stayed on the tracks, maybe it would just sweep me up and take me away. I opened my eyes just in time to see the black grill of a real train staring me down. It wasn't going to sweep me away. It was planning to run me over. That's why you should never, ever tarry or mess around or play on railroad tracks. It's very dangerous. I hopped off the tracks, my heart pounding as the wind from the train nearly knocked me over. As it went past, I could tell it was slowing down, beckoning me to hop on. For a lot of rail riders, there's a powerful urge to keep moving. Even if you don't know where you're moving to, it's better than just staying still. Jump on, jump on, jump on, the boxcars taunted. I reached out my hand, reaching for the only home I'd known, tracks and trains, reaching for Gideon. Then the sound died down and the train moved on. I stood mourning the silence. I'd missed my chance. And then Shady was there. He placed a steady hand on my shoulder and together we watched the caboose disappear around the bend. Shady handed me two bags of flour to carry while he toted two bags of coffee. We walked in silence for a time. Then he said, kind of like a hot air balloon. I looked at him puzzled. 
he shook the bags hanging at his sides. Ballast, like the sandbags that hang off the basket of a hot air balloon to keep it weighted and steady. I rode in one a long time ago. Fellow was given rides for 15 cents. Going up, it felt so light and thrilling like. You could see everywhere in the world a person might want to go. But after a time, a body just wants to be back in a place where it belongs. He shook the bags hanging at his side. Ballast. So you can use those weighted bags on a hot air balloon to keep you upright. And when the conductor stops um, applying the heat or the flame to cause it to climb, those ballasts will bring you back down to earth. So he's saying, it seems all exciting when you start an adventure, but there's times you just want to come back home. Do you think he knows how she's feeling? His eyes were red again, his face unshaven. He'd been out all night. I'd heard a harmonica playing again that night before and wondered if it was the sound that lured him out. Like the ocean sirens Gideon told me about. They were kind of like mermaids and their song lured seamen to crash, to, to crash their ships into the rocks. I didn't think poorly of Shady. I'd seen my share of folks who looked to a bottle of whiskey for whatever they'd lost. I believe Gideon himself might have looked there if he hadn't been trying to raise a daughter on the road. We stopped near Miss Sadie's place and Shady took my bags. Will I see you tonight for supper, he asked, seeming to acknowledge that I could take off if I pleased. I wanted to ask him a hundred questions. Why had Gideon closed himself to me? Why had he sent me away? And when would he come back? I wanted to tell Shady I had an old cork on, of his on my window seal, a cork that had become special because it was part of a story. And I knew that story wasn't finished, but I also knew that Shady wasn't the one to tell me the rest of it. Depends, I said, what's for supper? Oh, I'm fixing something special. Let me guess, beans and cornbread. You peeked at my menu, he said, pretending to be hurt even though it didn't take a diviner to figure that out. It's probably all they had most of the time. I'll be there. It sounds better than what I got. I showed him my sack of skeleton weed, spider wart, and toad flax. Now, can you point me in the direction of some prickly poppy? That is the end of Oh, I see you. Yeah. Oh, we all see you now. That is the end of Dead or Alive, which made it sound like wanted dead or alive. Someone was wanted, but it was referring to Miss Evans on her porch. 169, page 169 to 176. So that's the end through 176. And coming up, oh, here's Betty feeling better from her surgery, but still feeling a little needy, but she's getting much better every day. Um, so after we finish page 181, you'll have another set of written questions to answer on the portal um, or download an answer. So you'll have a set of questions then, um, but the next video will be, um, for the next chapter will be in a separate video. In all seriousness, as big of a Yankees fan as I am and as much fun as I have teasing and tormenting my Red Sox fans, um, if you have not seen John Krasinski's um, online show that he's doing um, called Some Good News, S-N-G for Some Good News, he's doing it from home, I think it's episode three that takes place um, there in Boston where he's at and he actually takes a group of 
nurses and doctors who've been caring for patients with COVID-19 to Fenway and they got to go down on to the grounds there. They had a video playing for them. So everybody should check it out. It's a very feel good story, but my Red Sox fans should definitely check it out because not saying I'm ever gonna be a Red Sox fan, but if, I, if anything was gonna sway me, that was pretty cool. So hope you guys are having a good day and I'll see you in the next video. Bye. Say bye. Say bye-bye.